We are about to kick off the last session of the day uh, on Defend Corbyn, Fight for Socialism. This uh, is the title of a campaign that's been launched by Socialist Appeal and the Marxist Student Federation. It was actually launched during Corbyn's election campaign before he won. There have been dozens of meetings at universities all over the country. Resolutions have been passed. We participated in the uh, founding of the Labour Young Socialists. It's a very, a very exciting time for socialists because the election of Corbyn really raises the question of socialism in the concrete. What do socialist policies look like? What would a socialist Labour Party look like? And so uh, the fight to defend Corbyn really presents us with the opportunity to fight for socialism. And that's what this session is about. We're very lucky to have been joined today by Steve Headley, who's the Senior Assistant General Secretary of the RMT Union, by Matt Rack, who's the General Secretary of the Fire Brigades Union, and Rob Sewell, who's the Secretary of Socialist Appeal. Uh, each of the speakers will, uh, will speak for 15, 20 minutes, something like that. We'll open up to the floor with the questions, comments, a bit of discussion, uh, and then we'll bring the speakers back in at the end to uh, summarise the discussion, answer any points. So without further ado, I'll ask Steve to uh, speak first. Well, thanks, uh, and it's, it's my pleasure to actually come here and uh, address so many young people who are interested in Marxism and Socialism, um, and the Senior Assistant General Secretary of the RMT Union. And before we sort of uh, talk about Corbyn and everything else, I think uh, I'll sort of outline what, what I want to do today. Uh, because Corbyn being elected as Labour Party leader has absolutely been a sea change in British politics. But there's also uh, very, very important fights coming up for us as trade unionists and as Marxists and socialists. With the, the uh, Tory trade union, anti-trade union legislation about to be passed, which is the most vicious piece of legislation including uh, what Margaret Thatcher brought in. So that, that's another theme that, that I want to touch on, which is probably a good thing, because that's, that's probably going to stop Matt Rack repeating all that, so his speech is going to be a lot, a lot shorter than maybe it would have been. But sometimes I think, uh, I, I still think sometimes I'm in a bit of a dream. Um, Jeremy Corbyn's leading the Labour Party, John McDonald's the Shadow Chancellor, and the Prime Minister's doing really terrible things with pigs. And, and, and I, think that, I think if somebody had said this six months ago, that Jeremy Corbyn was going to be the leader of the Labour Party, uh, it would have met, been met with howls of derision. And uh, our, our trade union isn't affiliated to the Labour Party, the RMT. We were actually kicked out, and we were kicked out for not allowing the Labour Party to dictate to us what we were going to do with our own money, because... At the, in the, at the height of Blairism, uh, there was a Scottish Socialist Party, obviously formed in Scotland, and we were giving that party some donations. Our rule book actually said we had to give the Labour Party, we had to affiliate the Labour Party, so we were trying to send them off a, a huge cheque every year, and because we affiliated the Scottish Socialist Party, or sorry, it supported some S Scottish Socialist Party candidates, they kept sending us a cheque back and saying that they don't want it. Of course, I don't think they took the same... Uh, the same attitude with the leaders of business and uh, Rupert Murdoch and people like that. Uh, when they supported another party and not the Labour Party, they didn't banish them. And the ironic thing was, of course, that over a hundred years ago now, uh, the forerunner of the RMT, which was called the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants, uh, you can imagine the, the sort of times that was running in, we, they were calling themselves servants, they were, fu they were fundamental in forming the Labour Party because they saw that the, the Liberal Party weren't delivering uh, for, for working class people and working class people needed representation in Parliament. So there we have it, the, uh, the founders of the Labour Party actually got expelled from the Labour Party for supporting socialists. And that's why we find ourselves in a position uh, where we are no longer affiliated to anybody. But I'm glad to say that we haven't cut our links totally. What we did is our members decided we were going to support candidates who supported the policies that we were pushing forward. And uh, Jeremy Corbyn is part of the RM RMT parliamentary group. And uh, John McDonald, and I, I just, uh, it's sort of name dropping now, but you know, when you've been for a cup of coffee and a pipe with these guys, you, you can't sort of imagine that they're now the shadow chancellor and, and the shadow <laughs> leader of the Labour. It's, it's just, oh, oh Jeremy, oh, is, is he speaking again? Oh, I've heard that speech. Now they're selling tickets for it, apparently. You know, they're selling tickets to, for, for, for people to come. But it, it's, it takes a bit of getting used to. 
Now this, uh, Jim McCorbin and John McDonald have been absolute stalwarts and we've got about 20 members of our group, uh, our, our group that we support as a trade union and we fund those people. Uh, but, but we weren't going to hand money over willy-nilly to the Labour Party. Uh, people like Blair, who were attacking our interests, who, who, were, who were actually going around Europe boasting that they had the most restrictive anti-union legislation in the whole of, of, of uh, Europe. Why, why, why would we give people like that money? Uh, the sort of the, the, the children of Blair, the illegitimate children of Blair, the Liz Kendalls and people like that, why would we give them money? Well, we decided we were only going to give these people money if they signed up to things like rail renationalisation, <coughs> renationalisation of public utilities, uh, things on welfare that would protect working class people, a repeal of the anti trade union laws. That was the basis, and still is the basis, that people get money out of the RMT to run their political campaigns. And I have to say, every, every picket line we had, Corbyn or MacDonald or one of the other MPs, uh, Di Diane Abbott, people like that, came down and supported us. They've always stood shoulder to shoulder, not just we are trade union, but we have our, we have our trade union out there. And it was uh, quite funny because when, the, when it was Corbyn did get on the ticket, uh, which none of us expected, by the way. A week beforehand, uh, McDonald was sitting in the RMT boardroom going, we don't think we're going to run a candidate because uh, we don't think we're going to get enough support to get on the ballot paper. I mean, that was, that was a week before they decided they, they actually stand. I'm glad they, they reviewed that position. But the, the fact was, we, we thought the Labour Party was finished. We as a trade union thought the Labour Party was finished. Um, when, when we saw the, the, the wars in Iraq, uh, the, the fervour anti-union legislation that the Blair government brought in, uh, Blair, Blair was, uh, may, may have told many lies on many things, but what he didn't do, he didn't, never lied to trade unionists really, uh, because when he, when he said that, uh, before he was elected, he said, the trade unions can expect no favours from us. You know, you, you couldn't really have it much clearer. You don't really get politicians lying to you in the reverse. Uh, if, a, if, if they say they're going to do something for you, they're usually lying. But if they tell you they're not going to do anything for you, you, you tend to believe them uh, through, through your experience. So Blair was very clear about that. And uh, Brown came behind him and followed on the same policies. And I believe that uh, the favourite for it was Liz Kendall at one stage. I mean, God knows what would have happened to, I think, that in, a, in a way, uh, it, it would have finished the trade union movement's links off with the Labour Party if somebody in that ilk had got elected, but, but she didn't. And Corbyn's in, in position now. And this anti-union legislation uh, that, that they're going to fight, and I hope that all the MPs, uh, all the Labour Party MPs who call themselves Labour, will actually uh, oppose this again in the Commons when it comes back for the third time. It has to go to the Lords again. But if anybody is, is not going to oppose this, then they really should go and uh, join the Tory party where they belong, or at least go to the Lib Dems. Because uh, what, what it is, is they're, they're trying to lay down arbitrary targets. They're saying that 50% of people have to vote in elections uh, for that election to be valid uh, if, if we're, we're balloting for a strike. Now, this is a government that got elected on 25% of the popular vote. And they've done a survey that uh, if, if these figures were applied to MPs, there would only be 27 left of them in Parliament. That's from across all parties. But why have they picked 50%? Because they knew postal ballots, uh, because people, the, the figures are uh, usually between 40 and 46% vote in postal ballots. Uh, that it's, and the larger the constituency is, the less people that actually they vote. Because people don't tell the trade unions where they live. And remember, these ballots go to their their home addresses, and it's not to their workplace. And uh, sometimes uh, people don't tell a union they moved the address, uh, so we'll send it there, we'll just get it uh, sent back. We have to then start chasing up where this person lives. Some people just don't fill them in, they think, well, other people will vote. Some people sit them on the mantelpiece. But the, the average is about around 45% send them, send them back in, in our ballots. Uh, remarkably, since this new legislation has been talked about, we've actually done a lot better than that. So maybe it has uh, maybe it has g people up a bit, but let's let's not uh, fall into the trap that this is about increasing participation. If this was about increasing participation, <laughs> they would allow workplace ballots where people could come along and vote in the workplace. Just put your slip in. The electoral reform society could monitor it. There'd be no uh, funny business, or they could allow internet voting, 
uh, which are doing several other things. Uh, why can't people uh, have a vote on the internet? That would increase participation, <laughs> which is done so massively. They, they did that with the Labour Party leadership, didn't they? So, <laughs> so uh, I, I mean, I, I think the Tories were trailing it for the London Mayor as well. And then Cameron's on saying, well, uh, well, you know, uh, we're not, we're not uh, so sure it's secure, but apparently it's, it's okay to have as mayoral candidate elected partly on that. But that's the, that's the game at the run. They're trying to stop people going on strike. And it's not even a, a straightforward majority of that. If 50% of people vote, 40% of the entire uh, people eligible to vote still have to vote yes. So it's not a straightforward democracy. You get 56% of people voting and you know you get 27% uh, of people voting yes. No, it's not like that at all. 40% of the total that are allowed to vote still have to vote, so there's two barriers to get through there. The, one of the most more bizarre elements of the legislation is that uh, the, on picket lines, uh, it's not going to be an arrestable offence. You, you, know, you can get arrested and charged if you're not wearing a, an armband saying, I am a picket. You know, it's, so, so this legislation, and I, I don't know about other people, but con conjures up sort of visions in 1930s Germany. If you're not wearing an armband identifying yourself, you're going to be nicked. And, it, and uh, what they're also saying is that somebody has to have a letter uh, saying that they're the chief picket. So obviously if anybody goes, uh, doesn't turn up with this letter saying they're the chief picket, the whole picketing process is illegitimate. And you can't have a picket at all. Up until now, there's, there, there's been a guideline that you have six pickets. Uh, but now it's going to be legislation. If there's more than six pickets, then people are going to be uh, nicked and charged. And I have to say, I mean, that's, that, that is an important part of the legislation, and so is the, 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 the voting. But uh, in, no way is, in no way does it detract from, even if they said, well, we'll, have, we'll, we'll abolish those minor bits, and we'll abolish uh, the, well, pardon me, we'll abolish the need uh, for pickets to identify themselves, and we'll have internet voting. That wouldn't solve this problem, because let's, if, if we're going to have one law in this country for one person and one law for another, we're going to have one, one law for MPs and councillors getting elected, and another law for trade union elections, I don't think that's right. I think that, that it should be consistently applied across the piece. And I have to say, I'm very surprised at some trade union leaders who went off at somewhat of a tangent without discussing it with anybody else in the movement and said, well, just give us uh, internet voting and everything's going to be hunky-dory. Well, it's not. And the RMT's position never was that, and I don't know who these people think that they're talking for. They're certainly not talking for us. The um, back back the Corbyn. Well, Corbyn's been met, met with us, and he's assured us that the Labour Party now are going to 100% oppose all this legislation that's coming towards us. And I know some some people might think, well, you know, uh, what, what's what's the relevance of this? Well, it's the first time in a generation, the first time in a generation where the Labour Party leader and the Shadow Chancellor and actually the formal policy of the Labour Party is to be to stand beside trade unionists. And not only you know, uh, in Parliament, but actually physically they said that they're going to come on the picket line with us as well. If anybody's arrested for this, they're going to have our full support. So I think that's a tremendous turning point. And I have to say that, I mean, I never thought I, I would say this, but our union is, is obviously has its position, it's got its own, its own party democracy. And we have a debate on reaffiliation at our annual general meeting where everybody will have a view. And I think uh, the annual general meeting has come up in June and that will give people a reasonable period of time. They've assessed Corbyn, they've assessed the uh, Labour Party and where it's going. And it may or may not want to reaffiliate. But as a, on a personal basis, I mean, I've, I've joined the Labour Party, and any, anybody that knows me and knows my politics, <laughs> it, you know, that, that, is a, that is a tremendous U-turn. Uh, because the, the, and if, it's, if there's anybody smugly sitting up there that's been a member for the uh, past 10, 20 years or so, and saying that you predicted Corbyn <laughs> a year ago, yeah, I, I challenge you on that. But we have, to, we, have to, uh, we have to look at these circumstances, and I think Corbyn represents what is uh, a once in a lifetime, once in a generation, uh, certainly. Yes, yes. Uh, because we, we have got a genuine socialist in there now who wants to follow policies that are socialist. And what's he, what's he asking for? And you see, most of you in here are under 25, certainly under 30. When I left school, which was you know, quite a while ago, hmm. I, I had the opportunity to go to university and uh, study for free. And not only study for free, but to get a grant when I was there. Mm -hmm. The, the people of Britain owned the railways, they owned the gas companies, they owned the telephone companies, they owned their water companies. 
They owned all these companies. They were all nationally owned companies. And that's what Corbyn really needs to be making his policy to bring us back. This isn't, these aren't revolutionary socialist ideas. What they are is, is what we had 30 years ago. That's all. It's not widely out there on the left uh, that, you know, there has to be a revolution tomorrow before any of this can be achieved. But I think that's, that's necessary steps in the process towards socialism. Because if we can get all those things back under public control and run for people, uh, the, the benefit of people, and, and not the benefit of a few multinationals. If you look at our railways now, um, they're keeping fares low in Frankfurt and, <laughs> and, and in Paris because the national companies, the national railway companies of France and Germany and Holland, they've all bought up uh, massive shares in the privatised railway over here. You're getting charged the highest fares in Europe and they're subsidising lower fares in Germany and the German Department of Transport are quite, quite happy to say that. You know, well, we have low fares here because we're invested in England. So if it's, if it's possible for every other national rail company in Europe to make a profit from British railways, surely it should be, should be viable for the British government to make a profit from that and put it back into the railways. <coughs> I mean, you, you would think that, wouldn't you? But apparently that's beyond the mean of this Conservative government and beyond the mean of what was the new Labour Party. And I'm glad to say one of the first things that Corbyn came out with and said is he's going to renationalise the railway. He's going to do it slower than we want it. Um, what he's going to do is bring it in franchise by franchise when it ends. Our solution would be uh, just to renationalise it all without compensation. Uh, you know. I don't remember rail workers or uh, the people of this country being compensated when they privatised it. <laughs> I might be wrong, but I don't remember that, and I don't see why we should compensate them after they've taken hundreds of billions of pounds out of our industry and absolutely squandered it. So that's, that's where we are. And, and from Corbyn's point of view, if he doesn't start making the headlines and setting the agenda by saying they do this in the railway and in the other national utilities, and, and setting the policy agenda, we're going to be reading about him not standing up to God save the Queen and all that. And it, wouldn't it be remarkable, a, a remarkable fit of hypocrisy if uh, an, an atheist Republican got up and sang God save the Queen, the B and he didn't exist, <laughs> he thought it didn't exist, uh, to, to, to a hangover of the <laughs> feudalist system uh, which is here. Now, you know, I, I, I don't think he should, we should ever apologise for him doing that. But back, and I'll finish, I'll probably finish up on this, this point. I would encourage on a personal basis everybody uh, that's here and anybody of a like mind to yourselves to join the Labour Party now. I think Corbyn's been opposed probably by about half the parliamentary Labour Party. I think that's about, 150, about 120 people. But what you've had is 250,000 people voting for him and saying that they agreed with his politics and they wanted a change. They didn't want Tory light. They didn't want somebody to come like Blair to take over or worse than Blair. They wanted a real alternative fighting for working class people. And you know what? If we don't get in there and defend Corbyn and finish off this new <coughs> Labour mob, they are going to finish him off. There's absolutely, there, there's no middle ground in this. Those people are absolutely treacherous. I don't know what brought them into politics, really. When you've seen people before that joined the Labour Party, they wanted a better world. I think since Blair, people have joined the Labour Party to get a career. Most of them have never had a job. They've, I'm not, not having to go at university students here. <laughs> <laughs> but most of them have gone to university. They've got a policy wonks job down at Parliament, and then they've become an MP. There used to be bus drivers and railway workers and you know, some of you students. You, you, used, you used to have an eclectic mix in the Labour Party, it was all right. But you had people had, that, that went and did a day's work and had connections with working class people and trade unions in that, in that movement. You haven't got that anymore. And that's what Corbyn needs to change most of all. He's got to bring working class people right into the heart of the Labour Party. So this isn't something I, I think that we can stand by on and just watch from the sidelines. Because if he's done in, we're going to lose a chance in a generation of actually getting some progressive politics in this country. And why are they so afraid of him? For, they're so afraid of him because for the first time in 30 odd years, you've got somebody who can shift the balance of power 
away from the capitalist class towards a working class. That's it. The gravy train will be over for them and their lackeys, and they know it. And that's why they fear Corbyn, and that's why we should be supporting him. So if there was any, any one message I would like to give from this, uh, personally, I'll be supporting Corbyn. I hope uh, my union takes the decision to reaffiliate at our annual general meeting, and I hope everybody here uh, will we'll pay an active part in supporting Corbyn in whatever way they can, because it really is an opportunity that we can't pass. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Well, comrades, uh, thanks for the invitation to, to speak here today, and it is a great, uh, a great pleasure to be discussing uh, issues like this at such a, a time. It, it really is a remarkable period in uh, British political history. Uh, I mean, I spend it for me since sit on the TUC General Council um, and on the TUC Executive. And if you think about uh, Corbyn, you now have the leader of the official opposition who is far to the left of the vast majority of the Parliamentary Labour Party and who is far to the left of the vast majority of the TUC General Council. I mean, this is unprecedented uh, and absolutely staggering. And we've been through a, 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 a remarkable summer. And I think Steve's phrase absolutely right. This is the chance of a lifetime. And I, I think people above all else have to really think, discuss and address what we're all going to do. Because if the left fails, then we deserve to be condemned by those who come after us. If we fail uh, because of division, because of sectarianism or whatever, then we deserve to be condemned by subsequent uh, generations. Because this period will be written up in, in, uh, in history books and there's a huge uh, burden therefore on the shoulders of all of us who are, who are involved in politics today and just picking up on some of Steve's points and it is great to see uh, a lot of uh, younger people. I, I joined the Labour Party and I joined the Labour Party Young Socialists in 1978 and just to give you a flavour of the movement that had, we had then compared with what we have seen and what still exists you know, in 1979, we had 12 million plus people in trade unions. Uh, there was uh, almost, and it, okay, there were, there were people outside of the, the Labour Party on the left, but it was almost uh, automatic that if you were on the left, you would get involved in trade unions, get involved in the Labour Party, uh, and so on. I, I, as a youth delegate, was put on a, a trades council in Salford which was a huge organisation representing workers in local factories and industries, uh, but where they had a direct input into uh, the Labour Party, the Labour Councils and so on. There were all sorts of debates between the left and the right, but it really was a very different world to the one that we've seen uh, emerge over the, over the past uh, three decades or so, because we have seen, and there's no getting away from it, our movement has been thrown back. We have seen, we have today something like six, six and a half million workers in trade unions. Uh, the, the, the core of our labour movement, the big industries which form the backbone of the trade union movement, have by and large been destroyed. We had a whole period of uh, historic defeats of the steel workers, of the mine workers, in the print, uh, and so on. And these have thrown uh, our movement back. Uh, and that has had political implications. And that, those defeats, were the basis on which Blair and th that crowd took control uh, of the Labour Party on the back of the defeats, particularly of the, of the 1980s. So the, the very ideas of trade, basic trade unionism were thrown back. The ideas of it, and there's debates about what people mean by socialism, but the very idea that people were socialist in some way were thrown back. And also alongside that, the very idea that people should be interested in politics uh, has been thrown back. Uh, and people are hugely disillusioned with the whole, and, and I think Steve touched on it very well, the whole idea that politics becomes a career move for these spads and all these people coming out of uh, universities, getting special positions, all looking the same, sounding the same, and spouting the same nonsense, frankly. Uh, so you can hardly tell a difference between uh, which parties a lot of these people are in. And that, that's the... That's the, 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 uh, what has happened to our, to our movement. Blairism is a, a, a key factor in that. But it's created all sorts of tensions and fragmentation in the Labour movement, which wasn't there when I got involved in the, in the Labour movement. 
Uh, Steve has, has uh, noted how the RMT were expelled from the Labour Party. My own union voted in 2004 to leave and to disaffiliate from the Labour Party. That's not actually a position that I have ever personally argued for, but I will say this, it was without doubt a reflection of the democratic decision of our members in the aftermath of a bitter pay strike in 2002-2003 against the Blair government. We had a conference in 2004. Our then leadership said, actually, uh, we intend to take no different approach to the Labour Party. So no concession to the huge anger that existed among members. And the conference, I think, voted democratically to disaffiliate from the Labour Party. Uh, and I've been on record, and our executive is discussing it, the, the Corbyn position completely alters that. It would be crazy, and I, I welcome what Steve has said, it would be crazy for unions not to start to talk about, uh, about their relationship with the, the Labour Party. And isn't it remarkable, this voting system that was... Let's, be re let's remember, a voting system dreamed up by the right wing of the Labour Party <laughs> precisely to stop the left getting any hold, because their view is this, their view is it, the activists you can't trust, and actually if you go out to this sort of primary system, you'll get all these sensible members of the public voting, uh, and you will stop these, any nutty lefty, uh, lefties getting anywhere. And what a remarkable way that backfired on them, where in every single category, in the Labour Party members, in the uh, affiliated union membership and in the new supporting category, Corbyn wiped the floor with all those uh, other uh, so-called leading, uh, leading Labour politicians. Absolutely uh, fantastic, because underneath all this, in those years when our movement had been set back, when ideas had been set back, underneath it there was this huge subterranean anger against the political establishment, against the political uh, elite, against that elite in the Labour Party and against the failure of all those politicians, including Labour politicians, to do anything about all the attacks that we're having, to do anything about the cuts, to do anything about the attacks on our unions. Uh, all of these things underneath, there was this anger and that exploded in this support for, for, uh, for Corbyn. And the political establishment are absolutely astounded and they still can't come to terms with how Corbyn this so-called oddball on the far left of the Labour Party has ended up leading Her Majesty's opposition, as it is, uh, as it is called. And just picking up again on some of the Steve's book, we, uh, although we disaffiliated, we have a parliamentary group. Our parliamentary group is made up of solely of Labour MPs, people we hope we can rely on, because we don't want MPs who are going to stab us in the back, as some of them did in 2002, 2003, when we went on strike. But Macdonald... Uh, and I just want to pay tribute to John McDonnell. McDonnell has played a remarkable role in organising trade unions politically uh, and creating new political groups in Parliament on behalf of a whole number of uh, trade unions, ourselves and the RMT, as well as a whole number of others. So I'm, I'm sure the, R, the RMT executive, John McDonnell attends our executive regularly. Just a year ago, Jeremy Corbyn gave the report to our union's executive and uh, the relationship is so long-standing. We've got pictures of Jeremy Corbyn on a picket line in the first ever strike of firefighters in 1977. There's not many MPs who've got such a consistent record of supporting workers in struggle as Jeremy Corbyn and uh, John McDonnell. And we presented him as a result of that with a 25-year badge uh, a 25 year FBU badge in recognition of his work with us at that point. And right at the start, even though we are not affiliated, we've supported uh, John McDonnell in his previous challenges for Labour leadership. Uh, we went to our executive uh, and we put a proposal to our executive that we should support uh, uh, Corbyn's campaign. And I have to say, I leant across to our union's president and said, let's be frank, Alan, he's probably not got a hope in hell but it is the right thing to do for this union. Uh, and I am so pleased that it was the right thing to do for this union. I said very clearly early on, it should be a no-brainer for every single union to support Corbyn, because if you look at policies, uh, if you look at the policies that most unions have, if you look at the policies of the Trade Union Congress, the candidate in that election who was closest to the position of all the unions was without doubt Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, and I have to say that some of those disaffiliated unions or non-affiliated unions 
and some of those smaller unions, like ourselves, like the RMT, like the uh, Bakers and the TSSA, I think undoubtedly played a role in then pushing pressure on the bigger unions to, to, uh, to then support Corbyn. Because I've got no doubt, and I don't want to go into too much detail on people's personal positions, but let's be clear, there are people in those bigger unions who did not want the support for Corbyn without, and, and, but because that momentum was growing, that snowball was growing, they were forced to support, to come out and support, uh, support Corbyn. Um, and, you know, I spoke, at the, people will remember the big anti-austerity march in June, I believe, just shortly after. I spoke uh, on a platform at the start of that, and I, I said from the rostrum that, that it should be a no-brainer that the union should get behind Corbyn. And it was remarkable because the reaction to that clearly showed what the, 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 that, that support, that momentum was going to grow and develop. And you began to get the possibility that actually Corbyn could actually succeed uh, in that, uh, in that, in that uh, election. And so we had this remarkable victory. And we've had this position where tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have got involved and interested in left-wing politics. And that, again, is a chance of a lifetime, the chance of a generation that we can't afford to throw away. And I just want to go through some of the threats that exist uh, uh, that we need to be alive to. Because the very first challenge to the Corbyn leadership was about the appointment of the Shadow Cabinet. And I think you've got to make all sorts of uh, compromises, sometimes are necessary in politics. And let's be clear, if you're dealing with a parliamentary Labour Party where only 20 or so of them actually support you, you haven't got much choice about who you can appoint to the shadow uh, cabinet. And the day, you know, what, clearly, one, I think one risk was the whole thing imploded right from the start. But a clear challenge, who was going to be shadow chancellor? A key position in the, in the shadow uh, cabinet. And I'm absolutely clear that if Jeremy Corbyn had not appointed John McDonnell, as Shadow Chancellor, then to be frank, he would have been a lame duck leader from the start. And let's be clear, huge pressure was put on him within the Labour Party and, I have to say, regrettably, within the trade union movement to stop Macdonald from being appointed yes. as Shadow Chancellor. So it was remarkable success and it's a, a tribute to Jeremy that he did stick by his guns and he appointed Macdonald as a Shadow Chancellor because they are, the, they are clearly the two longest standing, closest political allies, whatever disagreements I, I, I may have them on this or that, uh, this or that point. Uh, and it was absolutely uh, correct. But there are now a huge threats to the Corbyn leadership. Uh, and the, there is a clear agenda to destroy Jeremy Corbyn, to destroy Jeremy Corbyn's leadership and to destroy John McDonnell at the same time. To end this rebellion, because what right of ordinary people got to start interfering in politics? What right of ordinary people got to start saying, we want politicians who are going to stand up for us and stand up against cuts and so on? So there are threats from the Tories, there are threats from the press. I mean, it is remarkable, the scale, even at this stage, we're not even in a general election campaign, the scale of the horrendous attacks, horrific and personal attacks on Corbyn and McDonnell that we've already seen day in, day out. They've got whole teams of journalists in the major press uh, and in the BBC, by the, by the way, looking at every opportunity to have a go at them and to expose division and to try and embarrass them. We've already heard, by the way, and this is a warning further down the line, uh, a national newspaper, the Sunday Times or whatever, reporting a general, yeah. a general employee of the state telling uh, the journalists that actually there would be direct action against the Corbyn government if they tried to cancel Trident, for example. Well, what sort of, what, you know, that, you, you get a pretty clear warning. So there is a clear uh, a warning about what might come along in the future. But I think the most urgent threat actually exists within the Labour Party and within the trade unions. Yes. Because there is undoubtedly, I would say whether it's half, whether it's three quarters, I suspect a majority of the Parliamentary Labour Party can't wait to see the back of Jeremy Corbyn. And there are many of them, scores of them in my opinion, who would rather see Labour lose the mayoral election in London, the Scottish elections, all the local elections and the general election in 2020. They would rather see a Labour defeat than see a Corbyn government and see Corbyn succeed. And let's not forget, 
when they talk about the because there's all sorts of expectations being put on Corbyn if he doesn't do if we don't if Labour doesn't do well in the Scottish elections that's it he's finished etc. After the general election, most of the Labour right and most of the trade union leaders were already writing off the 2020 election. They were saying the Tories will win in 2020 and what we've got to do is plan for after that. So we can't accept any blame on Corbyn. The idea you can blame Corbyn for what Labour has done in Scotland, by the way, is nonsense. What Labour has done in Scotland is down to hard right Blairites and they need to take the blame for the, for the failures of Labour in Scotland. I'll finish on this on, on three, three tasks that, or challenges that, I've, uh, that I, I've, I put in an article uh, just last week that I think we need to do. First of all, we need to build a united left movement to defend Corbyn. Uh, and because if we don't, then it, the, the whole project will come tumbling down. Uh, that needs to be, in my view, as broad as possible. It needs to be democratic. And there are all sorts of debates around this. We've seen the announcement of the launch of, well, a sort of semi-launch, by the way, of Momentum, which seems to exist mainly as a, a, an email system and a Twitter account at the moment. But we need a genuine movement that is organised in local communities, that is organised in the trade unions, and is democratic, and that is allowed to debate political ideas. But that needs to be, uh, that needs to be built. Secondly, the trade unions, we need to organise within the trade union. I'll just, uh, I won't go over what Steve said about the trade union bill, but the trade unions are facing, before the, uh, the general election, by the way, on the TUC General Council, the reference was made, if the Tories win, it is an existential threat to the trade union movement. They've all, well, many people seem to have forgotten that phrase after the Tories won, and many people, unfortunately, I think, want to keep their heads down for five years, hoping that it'll all go away. Well, it's not going to go away. We need to build a movement that is prepared to challenge the Tories, to challenge this government, if this trade union bill comes in. Uh, but the only way we're going to do that, because the trade union movement has beaten industrial relations legislation before, but it's done so, not on the basis, by the way, of abstract calls on the TUC General Council to do with this or that, but because you had on the ground a mass movement of shop stewards, well organised in industry, who created movements regardless of what the leadership was done, and then the leadership will be forced to move. So I'm, I'm on the TUC General Council, I'm prepared to support any calls that are made for the TUC to do something. But I think at the same time, we need to build a genuine, democratic, rank and file, shop stewards type movement on the ground. And that also then needs to discuss politics and needs to demand that trade union leaders do not start to put the knife into the Corbyn McDonnell leadership that we have in the Parliamentary Labour Party. And the final point I'd say is about ideas, because actually we've got the opportunity to start discussing really what sort of world we want to live in to start discussing the idea of an alternative because it had been rammed down everyone's throats for 30 odd years that there is no alternative. There's no alternative to cuts, there's no alternative to attack, attacking trade unions, there is no alternative to the market and to the rule of the market and to the international rule of the market. And actually what we've got the opportunity to discuss here is actually what can we do that is different. And for me, that's about opening a discussion about socialism. What do we mean by socialism? What sort of socialism do we want to argue and fight for? I'm very proud that in my union, I believe in the RMT as well, uh, the people who founded our unions, uh, in many cases, including the, the, the big unions uh, across the country today, were often people who saw the need to organise workers to fight over pay, to fight over safety, to fight over pensions and day-to-day -day issues, but also they had a longer-term vision that said actually why do we have to live in a world like this, why can't we live in a world that actually is not run for profit but is one in the interest of the majority. So the people who founded my union for example, in my rule book, the preamble to our rule book makes very clear that we as a union are part of the international working class movement and we have as our ultimate aim the bringing about of the socialist system of society. In the 1980s and 90s, many unions wrote those sort of clauses out of their rule books. I'm proud that we haven't done so. And I think this period offers us the opportunity, young people, people in trade unions, people in local communities all across the country, to discuss 
politics, to discuss what sort of movement we need and to discuss what sort of world we want to live in. And the Corbyn victory has opened all those possibilities. We've got to seize those possi possibilities and take the chance to change British politics fundamentally in our favour and hopefully to change the world in our favour as well. Okay, thanks Matt. Rob. Well comrades, um, first of all I'd like to say also that um, <coughs> it's a great pleasure to share a, uh, a platform with our comrades. A number of, well both I've known for a number of years. We had discussions, all sorts of questions, over a few pints. But which way forward for Britain, the Labour Party, goodness knows what. But uh, now things have come to a head. I think it was Lenin who said that theory is grey, my friend, but the tree of life is evergreen. It's the reality, the events which are, are vital. And I appreciate the points that the trade union movement was built, obviously, to defend and struggle on behalf of the working class, even for a new society. And it was the unions who built the Labour Party, financed the Labour Party, and the Labour Party, under the impact of the Russian Revolution of 1917, adopted Clause 4, Part 4, that capitalism could never solve the problems of the working class, that only the overthrow of capitalism could be the way forward for the workers in Britain and internationally. Now the, I think the, the knot of history is being retied here. We've gone through the desert, I would say. Politically, a period of, of reaction, of Thatcherism, of Blairism, of the retreats and the defeats of the past, the impositions. Now I think we've reached a turning point, and this Corbyn victory, this Corbyn revolution, as it's been called, although it's not complete, far from complete, certainly is a fundamental turning point in politics in Britain and also will have an impact, I believe, internationally. That the ruling class is terrified of what's going on here. I saw one article in the Financial Times said, well, it's like Podemos, it's like Syriza. And they said, no. These uh, organizations, Syriza and Podemos, they're new organizations. The Labour Party is 115 years old. It has roots in society, it's formed a government. It's a, it's a different weight altogether. And for this, these events to take place in the Labour Party, well, for them, is terrifying. And for us, it's a great thing. It's, uh, we are proud to be involved in politics at this point in history. It's a wonderful time. And we have to recognise why this has happened. The reason for Corbyn and the Corbyn movement is because of the enormous build-up of discontent and anger and frustration in society over many, many years, and particularly since the crisis of 2008 and on the austerity and the attacks on the working class. You could see the, the anger rising, not only in Britain but internationally, this anti-capitalist mood everywhere. But in Britain, it had no expression. It had no outlet. Ted Grant, founder of Socialist Appeal, great Marxist, understood that in Britain and the traditions of Britain, the Labour Party would play a central role because of the roots it has in society. And he said, sooner or later, events, events, events would transform the situation and transform the Labour Party. It's been a long, long time coming, it is true. But by Christ, this is what's happening in front of us. The Labour Party has been transformed. Hundreds of thousands of people joined in the Labour Party, not to support the right wing, but to change society. That's in their heart of hearts, against Blairism and all the past. 
And therefore, this has been a, a colossal transformation. Yes, by an accident, as I explained earlier on, I think, to the comrades, as Mark said, that uh, necessity expresses itself sometimes through accident. And for Jeremy Corbyn to be put on the ballot paper was the biggest accident in history. <laughs> Particularly those right-wingers who lent their, na their names to it, now dubbed the morons, the moron tendency. <laughs> And uh, they've reaped the whirlwind because it's not just Jeremy Corbyn and that he has played a great role in fighting for those ideas for 30 years, but what he represents, the hundreds of thousands and the millions that stand behind him. That is the t that's what terrifies the ruling class and what a left Labour government could mean. That is why the general staff are probably talking about it. Big business is talking about it in the clubs of uh, London and so on, as they've done previously about what they would do to a left Labour government. That's the music of the future. They write Corbyn off. I don't believe he should be written off. The way the Tories are going to act, making cuts of 40%, are going to be so draconian that people will mutiny, that they will see the only way out would be the election of a Labour government. And that's what terrifies the ruling class. Because let's be clear, for the ruling class, the Labour Party was a party to be used and abused. I think it was Ted Grant who used the cricketing cricket analogy. He said, you know, the ruling class put in the first 11, the Tories, the real representatives of capitalism. But when they mess up, when they got a bit of a sticky wicket, then they are, to, they, are, they are put to the side and the second 11 are put into power. The Labour leaders, the right-wing Labour leaders, who then carry out the dirty work of capitalism and clean up the mess, and then are thrown by the wayside. And the first 11 come back, twiddly-dee, twiddly-dum. That's what it's been like for, a, for decades and decades because the Labour Party has been under the control of the right wing. It's been under the control of the agents of capitalism. And while that was the case, it was a safe party for capitalism. It was a means by which they can control the working class. And therefore, this, this amazing fact, Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the British Labour Party, for Christ's sake, this is astounding and what it represents. <laughs> of course, uh, that is why the ruling class are in a frenzy. They're attacking him left, right and centre. He's a threat to national security, a threat to families, <laughs> a threat to everything. <laughs> and this poison is poured out left, right and centre, day in and day out. Why? Because they want to destroy him. Because they cannot allow a left Labour Party to come to power. What they want to do is make the party safe for capitalism. And that's why you got, I think it's about 90% of the parliamentary Labour Party certainly didn't support him. And then you have people like Simon Danzak, is it? From Rochdale, wonderful MP, who come out and said that we should get rid of Corbyn and on day one, let's have a coup against Corbyn. You've got this Tom Harris. I think he was kicked out as an MP in South Glasgow. Good riddance. And what did he say? That we should get an assassin. An assassin to get rid of Corbyn. These are, this is the kind of language, even before he got into power, even before he was elected. It showed the hatred of these people. Because what are they? They are extreme right-wing careerists, politicians. They've been there and nurtured under Blair and before. And they have ruled the roost in the Labour Party. They've dominated the scene. When everything was stagnant, we were in retreat. They're like a bath, it's like a bath of dirty water where the scum rises to the top. And these people are the scum of the earth when it comes to the Labour movement. They're careerists. They're in it for their own ends. And above all, they want to keep 
The Labour Party's safe for capitalism. That's their function. Bow down to the market, bow down to... They're Tory infiltrators into the Labour Party, if you like. And uh, they have declared war. Let's not mince words. This is going to be a life and death struggle in the Labour Party. The capitalists are behind us, not just the careerists. The capitalists cannot lose the Labour Party. They will fight and fight again in order to control it. So they have launched an almighty struggle to smash Corbyn, to smash the, 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 uh, the Corbyn movement. And therefore it's up to, yes I agree, it's up to us. It's up to working people, it's up to the trade unions. And I think that if anybody's worth their salt, they should be involved in this struggle. It's a struggle between the left and the right. It's a struggle between the working class and capitalism and the capitalist agents. And therefore, it's not a question of, you know, this, that and the other. This is the real struggle that opens up and I think that it's, it's great. We should discuss in the FBU and the RNT and I'm the first to recognise why they were kicked out and they, and they were disaffiliated. I like can first to understand the tyranny of, of Blairism, who wanted to destroy the Labour Party anyway. The first leader in the history of the Labour Party who wanted to destroy the Labour Party <coughs> and carry out the disaffiliation from the unions and turn the Labour Party into a bourgeois party, a Tory party. Well, that, but, but Blairism has had its limits. There's a huge swing now to the left. There's a radicalisation taking place because of the capitalist crisis. Of course, the struggle is not uh, preordained. It's a struggle of living forces. And yes, I know there are a lot of people who have different vested interests. But our task, in my opinion, is to ensure the deselection of all these characters. All those who are fighting Corbyn and stabbing him in the back, including the shadow cabinet as well, they should face reselection, which is a democratic right of party members to select who they have as representatives of the party. And they should be cleared out. They should go with the Tories where they belong. And we should have fighters as leaders and as representatives of the Labour Party. Oh yes, prepared to accept the wage of an ordinary skilled worker and not be parasites off our back. That's a vital question. But I think also, as uh, Matt uh, alluded to, this is opening up a possibility to bit debate ideas for the first time. It's been like an intellectual concentration camp under Blairism. Our task is to bring the ideas of socialism back on the agenda. Why? because we're facing the greatest crisis of capitalism in the history of capitalism. Since 2008 and the ongoing crisis, this is an epoch of permanent austerity. Capitalism can no longer afford any reforms. It is counter-reforms. It is a tax on the working class. And they're talking about next year, a new economic crisis that could lead to a depression and all that will mean for the working class in Britain and internationally, what we've seen up to now is nothing compared to what's going to come. And it's these attacks which will radicalise and re-radicalise the working class in Britain and especially the youth and women workers. That is why this, this, this isolated clique on the top of the Labour Party hasn't got a great deal of support, only in the, in the newspapers and the backing of the ruling class itself. And we have to say, as Marxists, at least we, rep we, re we represent the memory of the working class. We learn about the lessons of previous Labour governments. And we have a right to say that no Labour government should patch up capitalism, to try and make capitalism work better than the Tories. Because every time they've done it, They've ended up carrying out counter-reforms and we had the defeat of that Labour government. Capitalism itself is in deep crisis and that's the reason, therefore that we have the austerity. There was someone who said, well, austerity is a choice. It is not a choice under capitalism at this point in time. And therefore there's never been such a great uh, uh, need for socialist ideas, of the need to 
control the economy. Guys, when I entered politics in the 1960s, we had the Wilson Labour government. And in 1966, Wilson was, had a meeting with Lord Cromer of the Bank of England. And Cromer said to him, you have to abandon all your policies. We cannot afford it. It'll create a, a run on the pound. There'll be a strike of capital. As a result, Wilson abandoned all his policies. And we didn't know about it until he wrote his memoirs five years later. In other words, the Labour government is, is subject to the blackmail of capitalism. And we always explained, you can't plan the economy unless you control the economy. And you can't control the economy unless you own the economy. And that is why we need to have a programme, not of patching up capitalism, because all the things that Corbyn has suggested, I fully agree with on jobs, on taking back uh, uh, industries into public ownership and so on and so forth, of uh, increasing the, the living wage, of trying to f solve unemployment. But these cannot happen on the basis of a crisis of capitalism. We've learnt the lessons of Syriza in Greece, where Cyprus came to power on a programme of anti-austerity. And yet, within a matter of months, he's now back in power, carrying out austerity. And this is not because of the personality of Cyprus, who I'm sure is against austerity, but he's faced with the blackmail of big business. He's faced with the laws and contradictions of capitalism. And under those circumstances, he's do doing the dirty work of capitalism, which will see him discredited. So if we want a Labour government, which we do, we want a left Labour government. That's the only solution for working people. But it's going to be based on a socialist programme, which is not a secondary issue because of the crisis of capitalism. It's the only basis on which we can guarantee the reforms, guarantee the real needs of working people. Because on a capitalist basis, there's only misery. On a capitalist basis, there's only austerity. They're talking about not just one or two years, they're talking about permanent stagnation, permanent crisis under capitalism. Now is the time for socialist policies. If there was a time, now is the time. So I think that the struggle, yes, I'm in favour of a broad campaign to defeat the right wing, that's elementary. But within that, we need to also bring out the policies because we want a successful Labour government that will confront big business, and it's true what Matt said, the general staff will be there plotting, as they did against Wilson and other governments as well. And, they, and the Labour government has to mobilise working people to paralyse the reaction. And that can only be done on a socialist basis. Comrades, this is a, a wonderful time to be in. Here you have the opportunity to shape history, to shape our destiny. It's about time we tackle it. We seize the opportunity. Because one socialist victory in one country will change the entire world. And that's what it's all about. Not socialism in one country, but a world revolution that will transform the lives of every person on the planet and thereby guarantee us a real future for, the fut for our future. Comrades, let's fight for it. Let's seize it. Let's take it.